Space and time are an abstraction. Time flies. Life moves from the past to the future. What happens now and what will happen in the future is always a result of what happened in the past. In our world, something is always being born. Something dies and something remains the same. Everything in the universe is created, maintained for a certain amount of time, and then destroyed in order to be renewed in ideal form again. It's extremely difficult to say when Hinduism began. The tradition itself maintains that it's a timeless religion that has always existed. The origins of Hinduism can be traced to the ancient Indus Valley civilization. This would mean that the religion is over 4,000 years old. Along with ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, it was one of three early civilizations of the old world, and the most widespread among them. It was the real birthplace of Western ideology and culture. In the 19th century, after colonialising India by British Empire for several decades, many Western scientists had enough time to translate the books of Vedas into their own languages, as well as many Tibetan works which were based on Vedic teachings. Western culture used the Vedic knowledge to explain mathematics, astronomy, aerodynamics, metaphysics, chemistry, and also to explore medicine. By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire, because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. Today we've come together to speak about Vedic knowledge and the whole concept of Vedas. This is a uh, most important question because Veda, this word means knowledge, it's a Sanskrit word, and the Vedas are understood to be uh, having no material origin, that is, they come from God. In the Hindu culture, the creation of four Vedas is credited to Brahma. Brahma is the Hindu god of creation, and one of the trinity of Hindu gods. The others are Vishnu and Shiva. The Vedas cover uh, all different aspects of human knowledge, warfare, art, science, and of course, uh, most importantly, the spiritual aspect of our existence. In material existence, these three aspects are always present, creation, maintenance, and destruction. So therefore, there needs to be some personality who puts their consciousness there to in charge of these things. In the Hindu concept is the trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. The Brahma is the creator of this material world, or what we would say the secondary creator. He works with the material elements that are given by the Supreme Lord. Vishnu is the maintainer, and Shiva the destroyer. Many Western modern inventions are stolen from Vedas. Here is a list of Western famous inventors who were inspired or copied their works from Vedas. Sir Isaac Newton, English physicist and mathematician recognised as one of the most influential figures in the scientific revolution. Alessandro Volta, Italian physicist and chemist credited with the invention of the first electrical battery. Charles Darwin, English naturalist and geologist, best known for his contributions to evolutionary theory. Max Müller, German-born philologist and orientalist who lived and studied in Britain. He was one of the translators of the Vedas books. Alfred Nobel, Swedish chemist, engineer, innovator and armaments manufacturer. He was the inventor of dynamite. Dmitry Mendeleev, Russian chemist and inventor. He created a version of the periodic table of elements that he described in his book, Principles of Chemistry. Mark Twain, American author, stated, India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of industry, the grandmother of legend, as well as the great grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and most constructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India only. Thomas Edison, America inventor and businessman. He developed many devices that greatly influenced life around the world, including the phonograph, the motion picture camera, and a long-lasting, practical electric light bulb. Nikola Tesla, Serbian-American inventor, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, and physicist. He studied the frequencies or the power of sound. He was the author of the dynamic theory of gravity, but he never explained it. He stated that there is no energy in matter other than that received from the environment. 
Romain Rolland. The French scholar Romain Rolland wrote, if there is one place on the face of earth where all the dreams of living men have found a home from the very earliest days when man began the dreams of existence, it's India. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, German-born theoretical physicist, stated, we owe a lot to the Indians, who taught us how to count, without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made. He also said, whenever he found difficulties in experiments, he referred to Vedas for insights. Vedic knowledge is often confused with what today is called Hinduism. Actually, in the Vedas, the word Hindu does not appear. The concept of Hinduism comes from the Arabs, who referred to the Indians who lived on the other side of the Sindh River. And in that Arabic language, they cannot pronounce the S very well, and so Sindhu becomes Hindu. Numerous books are available in Hinduism. There are two historical legends known as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Uh, of course, many people know about the book of, called Mahabharata and uh, the Ramayana. These are two of the great Indian classics. The Mahabharata is accepted by Indians uh, people of Vedic culture as being the authentic history of India. And that uh, story takes place approximately 5,000 years ago at the end of the last age, um, in which there's a great war uh, on the basis of, or let's say, a war fought over the principles of Dharma. Uh, dharma means what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? What are the, the principles by which this world should operate? So. Like we said, this world is, has two different personalities, the divine and, or, or devas, and the demonic or asuras. And throughout the history of the world, there's always conflict between these two groups because they have different purposes. So the Mahabharata is a description of the Battle of Kurukshetra, uh, what we might call the First World War, in which uh, the devas, uh, or the divine, and the asuras, they were fighting for control planet. Brahmastra, the weapon created by Brahma himself. The term Astra means an arrow or missile. It was charged with all the power of the universe. There was neither a counter-attack nor a defense that could stop it. Uh, as we talked about the, the uh, battle of Kurukshetra, in the Mahabharata there's mention of the different astras or weapons that they use. One astra uh, is called the Brahma Astra. And this is actually a type of atomic weapon. Uh, it has its, its unconquerable force, but very different from today's atomic weapons in that the Brahmastra uh, will attack or devastate one specific thing without harming anything around it. So it, it attacks with irresistible force, uh, devastating force without harming anything other than its intended target. So it's a very intelligent weapon, very powerful and intelligent. Ancient scripts have influenced great scientists in Germany, America, and all over the world. Hitler and the Nazi staff were exceptionally interested in ancient India and Tibet, and sent expeditions to both of these places yearly, starting in the 1930s. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600 thousand rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. The United States government supported all work on nuclear weapons. Operation Paperclip was a program in which over 1,500 German scientists, technicians and engineers from Nazi Germany and other foreign countries were brought to the United States for employment after World War II. Nuclear weapons are so destructive and ballistic missiles are so swift that any substantially increased possibility of their use or any sudden change in their deployment may well be regarded as a definite threat to peace. Many German research facilities and the personnel had been evacuated, particularly from the Berlin area. These scientists contributed towards the first NASA rocket engines and what followed are the first flights to space. We want to look at new designs, new materials, 
new technologies that will transform not just where we can go, but what we can do when we get there. By the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And a landing on Mars will follow. And I expect to be around to see it. We announced six new sites for nuclear reactors. Clearly, we have to develop a training program for the 60,000 jobs that are going to be required in that nuclear industry. And uh, the government remains very committed to it. I'm proposing a $40 million initiative led by a high-level team from the White House, NASA, and other agencies to develop a plan for regional economic growth and job creation. And I expect this plan to reach my desk by August 15th. By doing that, we will ramp up robotic exploration of the solar system, including a probe of the sun's atmosphere, new scouting missions to Mars and other destinations, and an advanced telescope to follow Hubble. Uh, this government is very concentrated at the moment on uh, recovering from 25 years of no nuclear activity with what we've got. And we've got to concentrate on the reactors that are available that we've had approval for in order to get our first, next generation nuclear power off the ground. We know fully that thorium reactors will take 10 to 15 years to develop. There is a high cost in that development. Please forgive my ignorance, but what is thorium? <laughs> um, it is named after the Norse god Thor. Um, it is, uh, comes out of monazite sands, which um, are largely found in India and Norway. And uh, there are all sorts of other facts that she can find in Wikipedia, as indeed I did. <laughs> my lord, my lord um, while some very interesting developments and work has been done in India on the thorium-based reactor systems, um, is it not true that even those who feel the research is very useful do also admit that it will remain very much a second string for a long time. And is it not vitally important that the government should not be diverted from building the, for the fastest possible program of building nuclear power stations? Uh, and should it not be noted by the anti-nuclear lobbies that the German decision to close down nuclear power will make Germany much more dependent on fossil fuels and will greatly increase the carbon emissions from Germany? Yeah. Well, the noble lord makes a, a noble friend makes a very valuable point. I, I, in India, he of course is referring to the Kak Rapa plant, which um, the, uh, the Indians are, are trying to develop. Um, clearly, we must press on with our nuclear program. We are disappointed that Germany has taken a different attitude. I want to pay credit to all those people who are involved in the nuclear industry and in this debate, uh, particularly in this house, who've kept a very steady nerve whilst all around us is going, uh, is, is going pear-shaped. And uh, as a result, we will come out with a very uh, uh, careful and committed process for a new nuclear generation. Trinity was the code name of the first detonation of nuclear weapons, tested by the United States Army on July the 16th, 1945, in New Mexico. Production of uranium-235 and plutonium were enormous at this time. Oppenheimer's first words after the detonation of the bomb, he quoted from Hindu epic Mahabharata. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Shuddhashana Chakra. It's a discus that represents the mind and revolving creativity. It's also a weapon that cuts the heads of demons. Chakra is used for the ultimate destruction of an enemy. It has spikes in two rows moving in opposite directions. It's the most powerful weapon in Hindu mythology. Neither Lord Brahma nor Lord Shiva could stop it. Uh, the Devas, they also have their different weapons. Vishnu, he has four arms, and in two arms he has a club and a disc. The other two arms, a lotus flower and a conch shell. So, because Vishnu is the maintainer of the world, 
two, uh, two of these are for the Asuras and two are for the Devas. For the Asuras, there's the club and the disc so that he can keep everything in check. Huh? He can, because the Asuras, by their nature, they don't care about others. They run roughshod over things. And so they need to be, it's like police. Police have to keep the criminal elements in check. So the club and the disc are for them. But for those who are godly or uh, already agree to follow the laws of God, then he has the lotus flower and the conch shell. Pashupatastra in Hindu mythology is the most destructive personal weapon of Shiva, discharged by the mind, the eyes, words, or a bow. This weapon, when used, would destroy the entire world. Uh, Lord Shiva, of course, also has his weapons. Uh, Lord Shiva is in charge of the devastation of the material world. He's a very, very powerful personality. He's not in the category of living beings like us, but he's actually part of the Godhead. He is the shelter of those persons who are uh, immersed or uh, taken by Tamagun. So Tamagun means destructive elements, intoxication, uh, death, warfare, and so on. In August 1945, during the final stage of the Second World War, the United States dropped atomic bombs on Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I was in my room, which faces the valley, and suddenly I saw a light, like magnesium light, flashlight, which uh, filled the whole valley. And looking out of my window to find out the reason for this peculiar phenomena, I saw nothing beside this light. And turning uh, from the window to the door of my room, I heard a crash, it may, be, may have been 10 seconds uh, after seeing the light, the flashlight. And immediately I was covered with splinters of the window frames and glass sticking uh, into the walls and actually my flesh itself. The Mahabharata clearly describes a catastrophic blast that rocked the continent. It was an unknown weapon an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vrishnis and the Andhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. Hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. This looked like a description of deaths and devastation due to radiation poisoning and a nuclear blast. Based on these descriptions, many theorists believe that nuclear weapons could have existed in ancient times. However, it's not clearly explained by science how these ancient civilizations knew such an advanced technology. The more we try to understand this, the more questions we uncover. One of the greatest mysteries of all time has been the sudden disappearance of Indus Valley civilization on all of its population. What could have caused the sudden destruction of the civilization and the complete disappearance from the face of the earth? When excavations of Harappa and Mohenju Daro were done, archaeologists found skeletons scattered all over the place. The skeletons were highly radioactive, as if some nuclear devastation had caused their sudden and untimely death. The sand turned into glass because of the high temperature or explosion. This effect is called vitrification. The ancient Hindus could navigate the air, and not only navigate it, but fight battles in it. One of the most fascinating topics spawning from India's past is the story of ancient flying machines known as Vimanas. 
There are some records describing how to build one, and the instructions are quite precise. The ancient Indian epic describes a Vimana as a double-deck circular aircraft with portholes in a dome. It flew with the speed of the wind and gave forth a melodious sound. There were at least four different types of Vimanas. Some saucer-shaped, others like long cylinders, cigar-shaped airships. So Vimana, this is a flying ship. Uh, they're mentioned in many places in the Vedas. Uh, previously there were uh, flying airplanes and not mechanical devices like we have today using petroleum, but they actually worked on other principles. Uh, the description of one, there's one Asura by the name of Shalva, he had a wonderful airplane that could become invisible, uh, that had uh, many different kinds of weapons that it could discharge, it could fly at different altitudes, at different speeds. Any military commander today would very, be very happy to actually have such an airship. We beheld in the sky what appeared to us, to be a mass of scarlet cloud resembling the fierce flames of a blazing fire. From that mass, many blazing missiles flashed and tremendous roars like the noise of a thousand drums beaten at once. And from it fell many weapons winged with gold and thousands of thunderbolts with loud explosions and many hundreds of fiery wheels. Loud became the uproar of falling horses slain by these missiles and of mighty elephants stuck by the explosions. Those terrible Rakshasas had the shape of large mounds stationed in the sky. Vimanas were powered by some sort of anti-gravity. Vimanas took off vertically and they were capable of hovering in the sky like a modern helicopter. A fighter aircraft is a military aircraft designed primarily for air-to-air -air combat against other aircrafts. There are also bombers and attack aircrafts whose main mission is to attack ground targets. The, the modern uh, jets are highly equipped and ready for uh, operation in a nuclear warfare environment. Uh, there are also military helicopters. The most common use of helicopters is to transport, but, uh, but they can be modified to perform other missions or uh, even can be armed with weapons for attacking ground targets. The best combat helicopter is called Apache. It is armed with aerial rockets and can fly up to 180 mph. Very popular modern flying weapon is a combat drone, also known as a combat aerial vehicle system. And uh, aircraft of this type have uh, no uh, onboard uh, human pilot. However, uh, it must include the ground drone controller who must uh, authorize any, any weapon release to prevent uh, the drone attacking civilians. This age that we're in today is called Kali Yuga. And the influence of this age is to reduce intelligence, to uh, reduce the qualities of human beings. And so consequently, our lives are becoming more and more crude, not, uh, not better. Uh, the Vedic worldview is antithetical to what's given to us in the worldview of modern science. Modern science would ha have us believe that everything began from a big bang and it's evolving and getting better and better and that what we have today is a pinnacle of human civilization. The Vedic opinion is completely opposite, that formerly there were very grand civilizations and this age uh, has become uh, a much worse quality. So everybody's heard about the Golden Age perhaps and the Silver Age. There's Golden, Silver Age, Bronze Age and now the Iron Age of Kali. This means degradation of human life. So now we have airplanes, we have flying ships, we have atomic weapons, but these are very crude compared to the airships and the weapons of former ages. The future is a concept. It doesn't exist. The point of life is here and now. 
the Vedic worldview explains time as being cyclical, that history does repeat itself again and again. So these four ages, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, they repeat one after the other. Each age has different qualities. And so the, the Earth is somewhat like a multi-purpose room. So there's a time for those who are very saintly and a time for those who are very worldly. And each age has a particular religion that's given for the people according to their nature, according to their ability and understanding. In this age of Kali, because it's the most degraded age, uh, religion is made to be very simple. I do believe there was a technologically advanced civilization before our own. Sadly, if they existed, those cultures vanished away 10,000 years ago. A lot of evidence becomes more and more convincing. And for those who doesn't believe it, to be fair, there is no real proof that it didn't exist as well. There could have been an apocalypse-like event destroying in uh, the earlier civilization. In modern times, any archaeology from those cultures would be extremely difficult to identify. For example, uh, the Antikythera mechanism, a complex device with 30 gears that is believed to be kind of an ancient computer. It was found in one of the Greek islands. There are signs and discoveries being found all over the world. I, I think there was an advanced ancient civilization before ours, and what's more, it was most certainly developed elsewhere and came here, particularly in Indus Valley. The cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro were discovered. No other culture, including those of Egypt and Mesopotamia, were as advanced. Also, traces of artificial radioactive elements were found in Mohenjo-daro, such as uranium, platinum, and even thorium. That would suggest that these ancient civilizations could be familiar with nuclear technology or even a nuclear war. Now, this knowledge could come from another civilization somewhere else in the universe, and that civilization could be much more advanced than we have in modern days. Of course, are many different religions, and they all understand God in different ways. So it's not necessary that everybody has to understand God in the same way. They can have it keep to their own understanding of God, but at the same time, the process of self-realization and the process of spiritual emancipation remains the same, chanting the names of God. So one may use any bona fide name of God according to their religion, and still the result will be effective.